Houthi terrorists attacking ships in the Red Sea, Hamas brutally killing women and children in Israel, the rise of anti-Semitism on campus, and the threat of domestic terrorism fueled by attacks on American democracy. Right before Christmas, we heard from two of the nation's leading experts on terrorism and extremism. Georgetown University's Bruce Hoffman and Jacob Ware, whose new book, God, Guns, and Sedition, reveals how Americans need to wake up to the dangers that now threaten them. Not from half a world away, but right on our very own doorstep. From Ballard Studios in Washington, D.C., it's 13th and Park. We give you information, not a panic attack. I mean, look what's going on. I mean, my God. This was it. The kids were gonna die. That time is gone forever. This is the biggest story in America. We weren't prepared for this. Don't you want to speak truth to power? Toughest thing I ever had to do. Well, Bruce and Jacob, welcome to the show. I feel a little bit overwhelmed, both academically and intellectually, so I'm going to try to hang with the two of you. Bruce, tenured professor from Georgetown University, former corporate chair in counterterrorism and counterinsurgency at the RAND Corporation, and most importantly in your resume, a former goalkeeper for the Israeli field hockey team. I want to talk about that <laughs> later. And Jacob Ware, an adjunct professor at Georgetown University and a research fellow. Both of you, of course, are with the Council for Foreign Relations. The world is really focused now, or the country is focused on the world, I should say, in terms of everything that's happening, not just in the Middle East, but other potential threats, a lot of it having to do with terrorism. So the two of you sat down and you wrote a book, which is now starting to wing its way across America called God, Guns, and Sedition, Far-Right Terrorism in America. Now, God, Guns, and Sedition, why do they fit together? The book is really about our trajectory of uh, far-right extremism. And certainly in its 1980s and also its 1990s variant, there was a very strong religious dimension. Much like terrorists halfway around the world in the Middle East and South Asia, these individuals were using Holy Scripture to justify their racism, their anti-Semitism, their xenophobia, even their anti-government extremism. So that's the God part. The guns figures into it because... America is a country that has the Second Amendment. It's a very well-armed country. And throughout the trajectory that we describe over the past 40, 50 years, guns have played a huge role. And I mean, this is what gives anti-government extremists the traction where they could actually challenge the government of the United States. And they have to be taken seriously. And then the sedition really is the end point of the book because the trajectory we trace really ends in the events that unfolded on January 6, 2021 at the United States Capitol. Right. And I think that's the strength of the book is that there's a connecting thread that we identify that runs through this movement that culminated in the events that day. So, Jacob, let me ask you this question. How is mainstream politics kind of going off the rails more towards the extremes and unrest? Uh, how is that feeding into the threat that this book suggests that this country now faces not from half a world away, but right here at home? I think it's created a permissive environment for the kind of violence that we talk about. So actually in our book, there's really four trends that culminate on January 6th. The first is what we call accelerationist violence, which is a terrorism strategy that seeks to inspire revolutionary violence to create a cataclysmic apocalypse in which the, the extremists will be able to rebuild in the aftermath. Mm -hmm. We talk about something called leaderless resistance, which is a strategy of terrorism, basically arguing that we're not going to operate in groups anymore. We're going to try to limit our organization and operate more in terms of lone actor uh, violence. The third is something called great replacement theory, which is a conspiracy theory that says that there is a deliberate replacement ongoing of Western whiteness through things like immigration, uh, liberal politics, Marxism. That is operationalized, obviously, through immigration and, and black political rights, but is also being deliberately coordinated by those local forces. And then the fourth of those is, is social media. All of those things have come together, I would argue, in the last 10, 15 years in a permissive environment that has allowed these seditious forces to, to thrive, whether you believe that that's a passive environment that's being created by things like very divisive language and insufficient counterterrorism resources, or whether you think it's a more active environment that's being created through things like rhetoric. What's the bigger threat of those four? And, and and one of the ones you mentioned was lone wolf terrorism, I think you call it, right? Which one of those worries you the most? I mean, all should frighten all of us, but which one is kind of at, at the top? If there's one that, as you look forward, is maybe most uh, threatening to all of us. 
It's interesting. We tend to look at the lone wolf phenomena, the lone actor as something that emanated from the Middle East because, of course, right. ISIS was particularly active in encouraging people to do this. But that whole principle was a strategy that was articulated in the United States by a white supremacist, someone named uh, Louis Beam, who had been a grand dragon of the Texas Ku Klux Klan and then was the so-called ambassador at large for the Aryan Nations, which purported to be an umbrella organization. So he came up with this strategy. It wasn't original. It was something from World War II. But his argument and why the movement had to adopt that in the early to mid-1980s was because the FBI was proving so effective in infiltrating these groups and undermining them. He said rather than what was the stereotypical mode of terrorism throughout the world, established hierarchical organizations that were pyramidal with a command and control structure that issued orders. He said, forget that because it's being penetrated by the authorities. What we have to do is encourage individuals to carry out acts of violence in service to our ideology, exactly as ISIS adopted 40 years later, basically. And what he hoped is that they would cause individual or spark individual brush fires that would come together in a gigantic conflagration. And sort of the proof of his concept was until the September 11th, 2001 attacks, the most serious terrorist incident and certainly the most consequential in the history of the United States, the bombing of the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Office Building in Oklahoma City. So Timothy McVeigh did not belong to any organization, was not following anyone's orders. He was the archetypal lone wolf or lone actor who recruited one of his former army buddies to be a co-conspirator and a, a second former armor buddy that provided some assistance but then peeled off. And you can see the consequences. They were deadly. And unfortunately, you know, we're a breath away from another Oklahoma City in many respects because in writing this book, what struck me, having researched this subject since the early 1980s, was that the United States is in a very similar political and social climate where sedition, where anti-government extremism, where lack of trust in our elected officials, when fear of confiscation of firearms or some reconfiguration of the Second Amendment might happen, triggered Oklahoma City, it could well trigger another attack like that. I didn't finish the title of the book, of course. The rest of the title is The Rise of Far-Right Extremism. Is it only the right? Why is it not the left as well as the right? What, what leads you in that direction with a suggestion that maybe it's coming just from that, that one area? It's absolutely both. And let's face it, January 6, 2021 accepted the most serious incident in the United States occurred in June 2017 when a self-proclaimed follower of Senator Bernie Sanders yeah. attempted to murder Republican congressional leaders and, in fact, very seriously wounded the then uh, minority um, Scalise, leader, right? Steve Scalise from Louisiana. Louisiana. So yes, absolutely. But it's almost an apples and oranges uh, comparison in that the threat from the left is clearly there, but it's just the numbers are much smaller. The anger and animus has not spread. It's not part of really a four decade long trajectory or trend. Now, there was, of course, lots of left wing terrorism in the United States in the 1960s and 1970s. In fact, between 1970 and 1971, over an 18 month period, the FBI logged more than a couple of thousand bombings from left wing radicals. The interesting thing was that the vast majority of them were non lethal. And that's why we don't remember them. And then, of course, when the Vietnam War ended, the uh, left-wing terrorists mistook opposition to the war in Vietnam and a desire not to be conscripted into the military with support for a revolution. The United States leaves Vietnam in 1975, and the left-wing organizations basically cease to exist. Now, they've been rejuvenated in the 21st century, but they're a shadow of their former selves, and they're just incomparable to the far-right threat. Let me go back to what I asked you, Jacob. I'm very concerned. I think a lot of Americans are concerned about looking at our body politic and looking at the the nature of discourse. We can't talk to each other anymore. It's red versus blue states. It's, it's Republicans versus Democrats. It's liberals versus you know conservatives. I think there's almost an acceptance in this country right now that, well, I guess that's the way it is. There are two sides. We haven't considered, though, right, the consequence of that goes very deep into the possible threats to our national security. I don't think that has been something that has gotten the headlines as much as, is this person going to win over this person in a war of hate in a certain state in the country? I think that's one of the achievements of our book, actually, is we do paint this as a, as a bigger problem. Everything in our society right now, we want to boil it down to left and right. right. And we argue that the threat that we write about isn't 
really a left versus right or right versus left question. The best example of that is our front cover shows a gallows erected outside the US Capitol on January 6th. That gallows, whether it would have worked or not, was intended for Vice President Mike Pence and others like him, a conservative, evangelical, Republican vice president, because he did not adhere to this anti-democratic line on that side of the political divide. So this is not a question of the far right is coming out to get the left and minorities. It's a question of an anti-democratic, again, accelerationist movement that is going to burn down the liberal democratic state in the United States if we're not careful and more serious about it. So we have really pushed that this is something bigger than just uh, a moment in our politics. Um, it's something that transcends that. Let me ask you about the Hamas attack in particular. Was there anything different about that terrorist incident than other things you've studied over the course of time? Well, in fact, Jacob and I have, have written uh, several articles about this. I think first and foremost was the fact that in the past, it was very rare that you saw a terrorist organization that could carry out combined, coordinated, simultaneous acts from the air, from the sea, and on land. Al-Qaeda, the Tamil Tigers could do one of each of those, and that was sufficiently unique. But to pull it all together, as Hamas did, and we know now that they were training for at least two years, three years, in fact, to pull this off, that to me was extremely important. That's the first thing. The second thing is they use swarming tactics, which is not something we're really used to seeing in terrorism, in other right. words. Multiple attacks, Different platforms completely overwhelm the defenders, create chaos, completely throttle any emergency response. In those hours of vulnerability, they can unfortunately kill 1,200 people. So that's the second thing. And then the third thing is just the asymmetry we see in terrorism and warfare today that Hamas is using commercially available, readily obtainable quadcopters that hobbyists use otherwise, right. kidding them out right. to drop hand grenades that takes out the cell phone towers, and renders arguably one of the most sophisticated militaries and intelligence apparatus in the world, both deaf and blind, so that therefore that facilitates the swarming attack and then facilitated the coordinated assaults. Everything builds on something that happened before. So whatever Hamas is, is doing that is different, which is, and, and now I'm understanding more clearly from you, that's something that others can say, oh, well, we can use that too. And then they build that into their arsenal. That's got to be worrisome to everybody as well. Well, Adam, you've hit the nail on the head. This is, I think, the problem in counterterrorism for decades is that terrorists are very good learners and they learn from one another's and they learn from their mistakes and from others' mistakes. And then they seek in the future to operationalize their success based on that learning curve. Jacob, I'm going to pick on you now. Talking about the reaction to Hamas's terrorist attack on Israel, the reaction on America's university and college campuses, which has been in the news of late and I think has got everybody very concerned. We're going to play this clip and we'll take it from there. At Tulane University's campus in New Orleans, Jewish students organized a unity rally. The scene, a far cry from what took place last week. Just off campus, a clash between pro-Israel students and a pro-Palestinian group. A Tulane student was injured in the brawl. Three others who don't attend the university were arrested. The violence that occurred outside our campus um, was horrific. These are not calls for peace. Uh, these are not calls for uh, Palestinian rights. These are calls for the blood of Jews to be shed. I don't think that's... An exaggeration, if I can just put my two cents in. Jacob, what do you do as a leader on campus to address a situation like this where emotions are red hot? Adam, I'm just going to quickly say that I'm extremely fortunate in my career because I happen to work with one of the most prominent counterterrorism scholars uh, in the world who wrote a very prominent article in Time magazine precisely on that question. So I'm actually going to pivot that one back over uh, <laughs> to Dr. Hoffman and see if he has any thoughts, because this is exactly his special. Oh, by the way, Bruce, if he doesn't agree with what you're about to say, he's coming at him. So. <laughs> but this is the great thing about our book is that it's rare that you get to co-author a book with someone that's 42 years younger than you are. I mean, so you really right. get two perspectives. And again, we're talking about the next generation and how preserved, this is what Ronald Reagan said, that democracy can be lost within a generation. So this is the great thing about co-authoring a book is that hopefully we can speak to the youth of America as well. I recently gave uh, two lectures on college campuses, one in the Midwest and one in the Northeast, and I had to have armed police present at both of them. And they were required at both of them. I'm not saying what, what is going on in our campuses is terrorism. That's not my point. My point is that 
any definition of extremist violence talks about not just the violent act itself, but the threat of violence, because it has it's designed to have psychological repercussions. It's designed to intimidate. It's designed to coerce. And this is why it's absolutely vital that things that do cross that line, that do harass, that do th- directly threaten people is not protected. I mean, it's harmful and it has to be addressed as such. But if you have a student on campus with a placard saying death to the Jews, I mean, where do you draw the line or can you draw a line on free speech that keeps people safe and feeling safe on campus? Well, you certainly can't prohibit it because it is protected speech. But presidents can take a stand and say that is completely unacceptable on our campus. And that's what we don't see as much of. It's basically a laissez-faire attitude that this stuff is abhorrent, it's criticized, but there's not a stand taken that this is outside the realm of what of the exchange of ideas that, after all, is the mission of universities and of higher education. But doesn't all this kind of lead into your very thesis in your book, which is if it feels like this is getting hotter and hotter and more extreme, the conversation in this case having to do with Hamas's attack on Israel and the response. If that's getting hot, that's just feeding into the threat of domestic terrorism, isn't it? You know, terrorism doesn't occur in a vacuum, so you're absolutely right. Uh, Contentious issues, even if they're polar opposite in what their aims and motivations are, um, even if their end state is very different, it creates a climate where terrorists of all stripes or political extremists can take advantage. They can seize on an environment to elbow themselves into the limelight and attract attention to themselves and their causes, when exactly as you describe, it's a very febrile climate. So, Jacob, if you accept this premise, and I I totally buy into it, that there's an unintended consequence of all that's happening in the protests over this war. The unintended consequence, because I think the students out there, a lot of them, they're venting, right? They're they're getting it off their chest, right? But they're not considering what that is fostering, fomenting possibly uh, in a bigger way. When... Uh, the attack first happened in Israel. I was I was shocked and I was really surprised because I felt it was a grave strategic miscalculation on the part of the terrorist group. I felt we were in a moment of kind of unprecedented global support for the Palestinian cause and killing that many people in such a public and barbaric way uh, was sure to uh, to limit that support. But I think the end goal here is we need to get back to a place where we value each other as human beings again. And we have much more in common than, than that that tears us apart. And the, the main problem with that is, I'll give you an insight into the book writing process of our book is, we wrote this draft and we felt very comfortable with it and we submitted it for reviews. And one of the, you know, one of the things that people commented on during the review process was, our first recommendation was we need to return to a place of civility. And people said, sure, but right. that's not going to happen. Right. Anytime soon. Right. So we really do face kind of enormous headwinds in that in that regard. And I think everything else in society, you know, domestic terrorism is one element of what's happening right now. But everything else, I think, comes from this idea of uh, we no longer trust ourselves to have these conversations with people. We no longer want to be tested on, on difficult questions. And, and that makes everything very difficult. In an article that you co-wrote, both of you, you wrote in part, the greatest threat to the United States now comes from within its own borders and the uncertainty of when and where the next serious act of politically motivated domestic violence will occur and against whom and what its continued trajectory will bring is the preeminent unknown unknown. Now, that's one that will keep me up at night. Well, the known knowns is that there are still people who believe that the 2020 election was stolen. And they've already made up their mind that it's likely, depending on the outcome of the 2024 election, it could be stolen. So the big question is, having failed to overthrow the government on January 6, 2021, whether these extremists don't have another go at it. And as we were just discussing, uh, whether it's terrorists, whether it's political extremists, the most effective learn from one another and learn from their mistakes. Mm. So therefore, I think it's entirely prudent that we be prepared for political violence in this country. The stakes are much greater in 2024 than they were in 2020. 100 police officers were injured on uh, January 6th. Uh, Some died, in fact. Will it be worse the next time out? I think another important lesson there, Bruce, is that my understanding of January 6th, not in terms of what happened in 2021, but in terms of historically, is it's actually a, a relatively symbolic day 
nothing really changes on that day. But it provided an opportunity and they had these extremists, they had momentum. My big concerns about 2024 is we've got a full year of political events that are going to be now pretty hotly contested from primaries to conventions to the voting, of course, and, and vote counting to the former president's court dates. There are a lot of possible moments where if there is intent to commit violence and there's capabilities to commit violence, there's going to be a lot of opportunities. And I think one of the big lessons is don't think that just because something's a symbolic day um, that nothing's going to happen. Are we becoming numb to the words terrorism and extremism? I mean, it's used so often in so many ways now. Is there a possible kind of white noise effect that could settle in here where we're not as vigilant and taking it seriously, these kinds of threats to, to the country we love. I disagree. I think the problem is we don't use the word enough, that we shy away from using it to describe things. I mean, seditious conspiracy, mm -hmm. nearly two dozen persons were convicted. One of the toughest charges to prove in United States courts. That's terrorism, basically. Seditious conspiracy is the violent overthrow of the United States government, which to me is inimical in a democracy. Right? We elect. We have orderly transfers of power. So I don't think we call this violence what it is. But I understand exactly what you're saying, because terrorism today is one of the most pejorative or subjective words, so people shy away from using it. I mean, look at all the major media that cover cover the October 7th attacks by Hamas. Right. None of them use the word terrorism. Maybe the Israeli press does, but the New York Times, Washington Post, BBC, Associated Press, even the Voice of America, which is U.S. government funded. In their style, she prefers not to use the term terrorism. They claim it's subjective. But to me, that's an accurate encapsulation of this violence. How could it be subjective? How could that act that was perpetrated by Hamas, coordinated swarming attack, be called anything else? Well, in the nomenclature of today, it's resistance, it's freedom fighting. And you see in news reports, militants, fighters, gunmen, all these much more anodyne terms. I know on campuses, even using the more neutral term insurgent compared to terrorist is seen as too pejorative or too subjective. And that's what's leading to the whitewashing. That's what's leading to us getting used to it. It's not that we're getting used to it. It's that we're avoiding it. So therefore, we're not describing phenomena that have very serious long-term consequences. I think one of the accomplishments of our book is we actually weave kind of a, a thread through a lot of incidents in American history that I think people will remember, but perhaps haven't contextualized in this way. So obviously, Oklahoma City and the Olympic Park bombing, I think people understand that as terrorism. But going through a shooting in a Sikh temple in Oak Creek, Wisconsin, Charleston shooting at the Mother Emanuel Church, Charlottesville, Pittsburgh, Poway, El Paso, Buffalo. These incidents are all part of the same trajectory. And when you kind of take a broader look and you go, wow, these acts of violence are all inspired by the same few uh, threads that I went over before, it's really hard to reach the end of that and go, yeah, that doesn't sound like terrorism. Terrorism is political violence, perpetrated for psychological fear at civilians by non-state actors. It fits those categories. Um, and I think it's important to call it, to call it what it is. And if you don't, you have the wrong countermeasures. Bruce and I write about domestic terrorism laws. Um, it's not widely known that the United States does not have a domestic terrorism law. So none of the people um, in the book, not a single one, has a terrorism charge against them. We have no law in the books on domestic terrorism? No. And we have a, a law on the books for uh, foreign terrorist organizations. Um, so, for example, Peyton Gendron, who kills, I believe, 10 or 11 people in a supermarket in Buffalo in May 2022, does not have a federal domestic terrorism charge against him. That matters for rhetorical reasons. It also matters for, for legal reasons. Um, he's not a terrorist in the, in the federal government's eyes. So I don't know if I should ask this question, but I will. If you were to say there, there are three kinds of terrorism or places where terrorism could take place that really concern me right now, I mean, what would you be focused on? Where would you be focused? Not just in America, but anywhere in the world. One of the arms of the Council on Foreign Relations did a survey uh, on, you know, of, of council members and fellows at the council and uh, of what the biggest threat, what keeps them up awake, awake at night. I was one of the people who responded, like the majority, I believe Jacob probably was too. That's domestic terrorism or domestic violence breaking out in what's already a very contentious polarized and divided uh, a political environment that can easily become inflamed. So that, 
And I would put right up there with that would be the kinds of swarming attack that we saw on October 7th, but being carried out against the United States by non-state actors, that is to say, terrorists, uh, militias, irregular forces in the service and in cooperation with established nation states. Jacob, wow, that's that will keep me up at night. Yes. <laughs> For me, I think the biggest fear is, is, is great replacement theory and the violence it inspires. When somebody kills nine black worshippers at a church in Charleston, uh, when a white supremacist kills nine black worshippers, when a nine white supremacist kills 11 Jewish wor worshippers at a synagogue in Pittsburgh, when a white supremacist kills 23 shoppers, Hispanic shoppers at a Walmart, they are trying to disrupt daily life in targeted communities. And that's the really heartbreaking thing is these movements, these individuals exist that are trying to send a message to vulnerable communities that they are in danger. And if we don't push back on that, if we don't push back on that activism, that mentality, the ability to commit violence in defense of that ideology, we're never going to be able to have a thriving society where everybody is included and welcome. And so I think that's one of the ways that this is not just about terrorism. It's about democracy. It's about freedom, human rights. So on a personal note, uh, how is it like writing this book with Bruce, your mentor? <laughs> Frightening. Um, I've said it multiple times. It's been surreal. And uh, I, one of these days he's going to realize that <laughs> he's crazy and uh, I'm not worthy. But I'm still just trying to hide that fact. So um, just taking it day by day, Adam. So, Bruce, how did you get do? <laughs> <laughs> Phenomenally well. I couldn't have done this book without him. And, and that was how we approached it. I basically wrote the historical parts because that's what I knew best. I was researching exactly this, these phenomena in the 80s and 90s up until uh, basically 9-11. And then ev like every terrorist analyst everywhere, I switched and focused on, laser focused on Al-Qaeda and then ISIS. Jacob wrote the post-2008 part and especially those that had to do with social media because the younger generation is much more familiar than that than people of my generation. And I think that was the success of the book is that we had to reconcile some of our differences, but also we had two perspectives that really gave the book, I think, its policy relevance and its forward-looking perspective, even though the heart of the book is tracing this historical trajectory. God, guns, and sedition. I now understand they do fit together and why. It's important, I think, for all of us that we open our eyes, take our heads out of the sand, and see what's happening and what the consequences of that could be. We really applaud both of you for not just the courage to write this, but the foresight, because if we don't learn from what has happened and what is happening, we can't possibly learn and be prepared for what's ahead. Thanks for joining us on the show. Good luck with the book tour. Everyone needs to read this, even though, again, I warn, it will keep you up at night. Best Thank of luck. Thank you so much. Thank you. Remember to subscribe today and hit the bell so you never miss another episode of the show with that trademark opener from Washington, D.C. It's 13th and Park. <laughs>